So we have the dimming of the lights and the beginning. Um, welcome to fellows and guests. Uh, this is very much, I feel, a Society of Antiquaries topic. There are many fellows past and present who've been involved in aspects of Rickman research. Uh, so we thought we would begin at the beginning and look at who is Thomas Rickman, first of all. Some of you will already be familiar with facts of his life. For others, it may be, perhaps you've never heard of him. So I'll try and uh, keep things moving and not get bogged down in detail, which is always the problem when you've been studying this uh, subject closely. Uh, if we work from the left-hand side, the left-hand image, this is a delightful, what we might call a, an affectionate caricature of Thomas Rickman, who's the fellow on the right-hand side gesturing with the big umbrella. Uh, all contemporary eyewitness accounts agree. He was short, stocky, energetic, hands always gesticulating, always looking straight in front, uh, never going backwards. That was Thomas Rickman behind the willowy, rather languid figure uh, who is, has tucked under his arm a framed drawing of a Gothic arch and several scrolls, doubtless of more drawings of Gothic buildings. This is Henry Hutchinson. He's probably a teenager in this view. It's probably taken in about 1819, which was the year that Rickman took a little office in the exchange buildings in Liverpool, right behind the town hall. Hence the um, inscription up at the top, a view near the exchange, Thomas Rickman and his assistant. Henry Hutchinson joined Rickman initially as his sole assistant. Um, and I think it was a year before this was drawn in 1818. Uh, and stayed with him until his very early death of consumption in 1831, an invaluable partnership. Um, this was almost certainly done by Charles Barber of the famous Birmingham family of artists, and Barber was a great friend of Rickman's uh, in Liverpool. Uh, so you can perhaps detect from Rickman's dress that he was a plain Quaker. So his, art, his dress would have looked slightly archaic for 1819. He wore knee breeches, broad-brimmed hat. He used the thee and thou in his uh, speech. This too comes across from contemporary witnesses who knew him in his own time. So to sort of stand in for his faith, a uh, member of the Society of Friends, I have from Pugin's Microcosm of London, we have an image in the middle of a Quaker meeting of, in London of 1809. Uh, the fact that he was a Quaker and what this meant in terms of his world view and his attitude um, to many things has been explored in detail amongst um, other topics by an FSA, John Bailey, in his 1977 uh, PhD dissertation. Copies are still on deposit um, and readily available at Friends House in London, for example, uh, in the library. And Bailey has done meticulous uh, looking into the Rickman family networks, uh, the, the meaning of the Quaker faith in terms of Rickman's development, and some of the early commissions. So it's still a go-to source for information on Rickman really up to about 1820. Now, that family network, well, we have a curious looking figure who's over here in the upper right, um, and he looks, there's a strong um, family resemblance to our Thomas Rickman, and this is Thomas Cleo Rickman. He is an uncle of our Thomas. Uh, Rickman called him Uncle Cleo, uh, and he was only 16 years older than Rickman. So they were, there was a bit less than a full generation, if you like, and they had a warm relationship, at, uh, particularly during Rickman's early years. Now, Cleo, as you may guess from uh, his appearance, he was famous for his sartorial eccentricity. He's seen here, he was illustrated in The Worthies of Sussex. Um, he has his own uh, entry, The Dictionary of National Biography <coughs> by Elizabeth Bajant, a very amusing uh, life, and he was a literary figure. Uh, he was based in Marlebone in London. He had his own press, so he was a publisher and a poet, and he's probably best known to us today as the biographer of Tom Paine, the radical thinker and author of The Rights of Man. Tom Paine actually lived for a time in Thomas Cleo Rickman's own house in London in the 1790s. So whether or not Rickman actually met Tom Paine, uh, certainly Uncle Cleo was quite a maverick, an independent thinker, and an early family influence. Uh, in fact, it was 1819, the year Rickman published the second edition of his famous handbook to Gothic architecture that we'll look at in the next slide. Um, in the same year, Uncle Cleo uh, is publishing the biography of Tom Paine. So there was more than one literary figure 
in the Rickman family. And of course, they came from deepest Sussex. Rickman was actually born and raised in Maidenhead until uh, he was 21. His father, because of financial reasons, relocated back to the family clan in deepest Sussex. So we're looking at the bottom right, the church of St. Thomas Becket in Cliff High Street um, in Lewis, the family, the sort of family HQ. It's an Anglican parish church. Both of these Thomas Rickmans were married there because they were complicated Quakers. Um, Uncle Cleo married out and was never reinstated to the Quakers. He married an Anglican. And uh, not too much later, his nephew Thomas Rickman, our antiquarian architect, um, married his first cousin. She was a Quaker, but marriage between first cousins was forbidden by the friends. It was okay with the Anglicans. Uh, so he too was disowned um, and not quite married out, but married his cousin. So it's a, he was a complicated person right from the start, um, a mixture of sort of influences from southern and then eventually northern England and the Midlands. He's a truly national figure rather than a regional figure. And although he was a dedicated Quaker, devoted to his faith for almost the entire length of his life, he knew Anglican worship very well. He attended, he loved a good Christmas Eve mass in Chester Cathedral, uh, and many of his closest friends were Anglican clergymen. So a complicated fellow and a very interesting one. So what is Rickman known for? Well, as Alex will be explaining, the Rickman Research Project commemorates the bicentenaries of two consecutive dates. The first of these is 1817, when the first edition of his famous handbook of Gothic architecture is published. Uh, this became known eventually under the title of An Attempt to Discriminate the Styles of Architecture in England. You're looking at the title page of the fourth edition, that's 1835, and that was the final edition that Rickman himself saw through to press. He, was, uh, he kept the same core text that he had published in 1817, with the first edition, and just simply added material as he went along. And there were three posthumous editions. Uh, the last was in 1881. So this is a pretty impressive track record of uh, publishing history of one particular volume, 1817 to 1881. And the core text and the original illustrations get reproduced along with more and more material that is added to the text. A sample page from the fourth edition, the 1835 edition, is seen below. We have a perpendicular porch and then profiles of moldings. Now, the word perpendicular is thought to be Rickman's original contribution to the history of Gothic architecture. He's the person who comes up with the four-part naming of the parts, if you like, of medieval architecture in the British Isles. So Norman, early English, as in Salisbury Cathedral, decorated Gothic, as in Wells Cathedral, and perpendicular, as in King's College Chapel in Cambridge, for example. That's Rickman's terminology. Others debated a bit about the terminology after Rickman's publication, but uh, I think we need to observe no more than the fact that the Buildings of England series today, even the revised volumes published most recently, all use Rickman's terminology, and in fact, elegant abbreviations per deck EE. So it's all Rickman's language. Uh, the, it was a first. It's perhaps, we use this language so much now to describe Gothic architecture, it's maybe a bit difficult to imagine a time when the terminology wasn't worked out and the chronology of the styles was a bit of a mystery. So Rickman gets there first, probably because of that objectivity, being a Quaker and being raised with a scientific uh, education rather than an education in the classics or the humanities. So the attempt to discriminate uh, styles of architecture in England. Now, uh, profiles of mouldings are something he absolutely loved. Why profiles of mouldings? Aren't they incredibly tedious? I'll show you some in, uh, primary materials in the next slide. Rickman was absolutely dedicated to the idea that to get an authentic look of a medieval building, one had to have the right proportions and the right mouldings, the right ornamental features. Uh, so these are moulding profiles which could actually be reproduced by uh, an intelligent craftsman. So that's 1817, the, the first of the seven editions of the attempt uh, we're celebrating this year, the bicentenary. What about 1818? Well, I'm sure we'll uh, not surprise many of you to hear. Uh, next year, we celebrate the bicentenary of the Church Building Act, which creates 
the commissioners' churches, a new kind of uh, architecture, if you will, being uh, from a uh, product of state and church patronage. So we have examples here of Rickman's commis um, commissioners' churches, one uh, built to a very tight budget and one built to a, a very liberal budget. Guess which one is which? Um, uh, you guessed it. It's the one on the top uh, where I think it was in excess of £20,000 was spent on this church. It's very impressive. This is the Church of St George in Chorley in Lancashire. It's close to Preston. And it's not only a beautiful example of, on the whole, Rickman's decorated Gothic style. It was built in the early 1820s, but it's surrounded by the most attractive square and terraced housing, all of a contemporary date of the 1820s. It's situated on a particular position, the highest rise of land in the town, so that imposing tower would have been viewed from any vantage point, any perspective. And there are a lot of reasons why uh, the Anglicans wanted the churches to be very, very visible from many directions. But Rickman was intensely interested in site, siting of buildings, the geology of the site, and also local building traditions. I think he was really quite ahead of his time in that regard. So this is an example, St. George Chorley, uh, of a very, very uh, lavishly built commissioner's church. And it's equally impressive inside, with lots of kind of abstractions of timbering uh, from the medieval period, a very impressive building. Uh, of course, his first commissioner's uh, church, as many of you will know, is St. George in Birmingham, which has um, long been demolished. Uh, St. George in Chorley actually reused some of the cast iron window tracery, some of the interior fittings and features. So it's thought to be the closest remaining example of a Rickman church to the original commissioner's church. And then down below, I actually... I've grown quite fond of this ugly little building. Uh, this is St. David's Hay near Wigan. Uh, as you see, it is basically a rectangular box. It's built out of very dull, uh, rather coarse sandstone. It's of early English style. So we have these very narrow pointed windows running, you know, alternating with buttresses down the side of the building. It's early 1830s in date. Rickman explained that if you don't have much money to spend on a church, and this was built for 3,400 pounds, so a fraction of uh, what was spent on Chorley, for example, if you haven't got much money, then early English is the style to use because it doesn't need a lot of fripperies, as he called them. Uh, and if you can't afford a West Tower, you must at least have a notional West Tower, hence the little belfry uh, over on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, so, we have an example of a, a relatively poor commissioner's church, or cheap commissioner's church, which gave the genre a bad name, and occasionally Rickman a bad name, and yet, when he had sufficient funds, he could do uh, really beautiful work. However, and of course I should say, uh, the work has, uh, the definitive study of commissioner's churches uh, has already been published in a revised uh, second edition by Michael Port, who's, uh, it's an essential, this, his work is an essential port of call for anybody studying this subject. There's quite a bit on Rickman, because Rickman, I think by one example, actually built more commissioner's churches than any other architect uh, for the Anglicans. But his practice was much broader than this. Uh, he actually built more privately funded churches than commissioners' churches, some of them uh, very expensive bits of building of great beauty uh, in a range of styles. He had a considerable practice as a country house architect. In the 1830s, he particularly developed the idea of the Tudor or Elizabethan country house. Again, he wasn't the first, but it was quite, um, it was certainly uh, out there at the cutting edge of his time in terms of uh, lots of aspects of country house design just before the Victorian period begins. Church monuments, furniture, fireplaces, market crosses, institutions. Uh, he considered one of his masterpieces certainly to be the new court of St. John's College, Cambridge. I think he probably was right about that. So institutional architecture as well. So we had a fully rounded practice from Glasgow to Kent, uh, from Northern Ireland to Essex. So the full length and breadth really of the British Isles. So he's more than, although uh, it was a very important element of his work, he's more than just a commissioner's church architect. So what are the problems facing the biographer of Rickman? Why is it we only have one biography, a slender volume, written by his son in 1901? Well, 
the Rickman archive is very large. That's one of the, both the, um, the great benefits of working on this topic and of course one of the great challenges. So if we sort of work counterclockwise, I'll tell you a bit about uh, what these things are, beginning with the diaries, the chest of diaries spilling out, which are now in the RIBA study room housed in the b &A. There are 57 <coughs> volumes of diaries left to us by Thomas Rickman, and the way the <coughs> earliest diary begins in 1807 implies there were earlier diaries which have been lost. They leave off in the spring of 1834 when he had the first attack of a very serious illness. He eventually died of liver cancer. Uh, so he was very ill on and off for the remainder of his life. He died in 1841. You'll note that the diaries are all identical in size, regardless of date. Um, and each day, no matter what happened on the day, no matter how busy, got one page. So the same space was allocated to every single day in his life during the period of the diaries. He recorded things like the weather, conjunctions of the planets um, interested him greatly, historical events, the death of George III, all manner of things recorded, Napoleon, uh, as well as uh, where he went, um, what buildings he visited, and initially what architecture um, and what projects he was involved in. So they're invaluable, but they're also challenging. If you've ever, some of you may have already looked into them for various projects. They're not remotely searchable, they're not indexed. If you're looking for a building, you need to have pretty precise dates, uh, when to um, look, where to look in the diaries. Uh, and also abbreviations. As with many diarists, Rickman had his own personal system of abbreviations. You have to sort of get to know what he means by, um, for instance, the, the initials HH almost always refer to Henry Hutchinson, but Henry Hutchinson is also referred to as Henry in the diaries. And occasionally, Rickman's younger brother, Henry, would come up and would spend a week in the office and go on sketching tours of North Wales with Rickman. So is it Henry Rickman, Rickman's younger brother, who's being referred to as Henry, or or is it Henry Hutchinson, or is it another Henry? Then the Marianne's, later in the 1830s, nearly every other woman Rickman seemed to meet, including his young daughter, his surviving daughter, they were all named Marianne. The widow of Henry Hutchinson was Marianne. So which Marianne is it? Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it takes a bit of reading around uh, the dates to try and work it out. So that's just one very obvious way in which the diaries take a bit of care. Other um, types of archival material which survives in the lower left, uh, one of the finished drawings, which are now, um, I think over 100 now in the RIBA study room, and there are drawings scattered around in other collections. The National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth has some drawings. Rickman actually had quite a strong connection to North Wales in terms of projects and antiquarian study. This is a, simply a project, never an executed building of 1815, for a Gothic residence, uh, combining ancient grandeur with modern convenience, as Rickman described it, for the Duke of Wellington. And it was simply one of his projects um, that was never executed. So um, as one goes along, d does this building actually survive that you're reading about in the diaries? Uh, so thank goodness the RIBA has a full set of Pevners and Gazetteers that I can go to when I have names of towns and names of churches uh, to look them up. In the middle and in the lower right, uh, we have examples of the materials in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, over 2,000 architectural drawings and sketchbooks, some of great beauty, such as this. In the middle, it's a sketch freehand by Rickman in his characteristic brown ink of the east window of St. Mary's in Warwick, done around 1820, and then more moldings, early English moldings, this time in the lower right, uh, taken in 1828 from churches in Gloucestershire. These are all part of the Bodleian cache, and they were acquired by the um, antiquary John Henry Parker, the publisher, who uh, bought a great deal of Rickman's papers from his widow after Rickman's death. And then related materials, not the least of which are the family materials, the broader Rickman family, which includes the Hodgkin family, the medical family, for whom Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is named, and also people like Luke Howard, the father of modern meteorology. Luke Howard was a Quaker, pharmaceuticals manufacturer in Yorkshire, and he married into the extended Rickman family. 
uh, 10 years before Brickman comes up with his four-part uh, nomenclature for Gothic and medieval architecture, Howard comes up with a four-part structure for naming the clouds. And we still use this language today, nimbus, cumulus, stratus, and cirrus. So, the, and he was doing this in evenings and weekends, much as Rickman was, scotch, um, was sketching churches, uh, rather, Howard is sketching clouds. So, fascinating. Um, I did find out, by the way, a sort of completely uh, sort of a left field discovery, if you like, from a contemporary eyewitness account that Rickman's office hours started at 10 a.m. in the morning and ended at 4 p.m., sort of with the hours of daylight during the winter almost. And this left him time in evenings, weekends, and particularly of the lighter <coughs> summer months to do a lot of travel, uh, which he did constantly. So the archive is a very, very large one. There are also the day books, the actual professional office day books, which are in the British Library. And these range from 1821 in date to 1837. Immensely useful when one is researching a particular building. So what I've been focusing on over time, this is a project that has developed over many years. I realize there's no way to do a comprehensive biography of this fascinating antiquarian architect without reading every word of the diaries. I finally finished, in honor of the conference in Liverpool, which Alex will be telling you about in May, I finished all 57 volumes, and I've done transcriptions by hand. I'm a great believer in writing to get facts and ideas into the brain. I'm now in the stage of typing up into Word documents the transcriptions, which are selective, which are my own transcriptions, according to what I'm uh, deeming important. I'm typing them up. I've got as far as 1821. I'm bolding all proper names, buildings, places, people, and starting to compile in chronological order to kind of cut and paste into new documents compilations from the diaries uh, recording uh, these uh, people and places, and creating a gazetteer. I'm up to the beginning of 1821. I have 30,000 words. I imagine by the end of 1837, when Rickman handed over his architectural practice, I'll probably be well over 100,000 words. But I think this is one of two documents I'm creating which are essential, if you like, moments of digestion, pausing and digesting the material before I can go on to actually know what I'm dealing with and write it up. And the final document I'm creating out of this work with the diaries is a themes document, and some fascinating information is starting to be thrown up, but it's tiny little nuggets here and there that I'm starting to cull from the diaries. So, Rickman's attitudes towards architectural conservation. He was most reluctant to tear buildings down if they had life left in them, if they had some um, structural integrity. His family life, all three wives, of Rickman are interesting figures in their own right. The third one, Elizabeth Miller Rickman, was actively involved in the production of the later volumes of the attempt and Rickman's um, antiquarian writing. Rickman and the church commissioners, very amusing, acerbic little comments based about meetings he's had in London, and office design and office practices. I'm actually starting to build up a picture of who was in the office, what it looked like, um, where they all sat, how they dealt with visitors coming into the office. But it's all just this painstaking work, little nuggets uh, starting to be combined to build up a picture. So I have a few mood boards, if you like, for uh, the remainder of my uh, few minutes. What can Rickman's diaries reveal about him? This is uh, literally, as um, one fellow said at over tea, this is literally chipping away at the coal face. I've got baskets, I'm sorting by color, size, and shape, raw data. Uh, so what's starting to emerge? Well, people and places, really, is the theme of this slide. On the left, you may recognize the view of uh, the antiquary Edward Bloor. Big influence on Rickman. They met in 1811, sketching in Lincoln Cathedral. And he says Bloor taught him techniques of shading and perspective and drawings, improved his drawing style. Bloor eventually uh, successfully uh, proposed Rickman for election to the uh, Society of Antiquaries. That didn't happen until 1829, when he was, a, he was finally elected. And it was the honor, clearly, he, he prized m above all uh, during the course of his professional life. On the opposite side of the screen, we have a rather remarkable man, Bishop Henry Law, first Bishop of Chester, then Bishop of Bath and Wells in the 1820s. And he was a major supporter of Thomas Rickman. 
uh, which is interesting, an example of Rickman's friendship with the Anglican clergy, not simply with antiquaries. Uh, Bishop Law, as he was, proposed Rickman in 1818 and again in 1819, both times unsuccessfully for election to the Fellows. Um, but finally, as I say, ten years later, it did happen with Bloor uh, proposing him, and he was duly elected. In the middle, the kinds of literature that Rickman used is noted, it's scribbled at the tops of some of those rather small pages in the diaries. In this case, Daniel and Samuel Lysons, Magna Britannia. Uh, of course, it went alphabetically. Unfortunately, I think they ran out of steam at the letter D, but Chester and Cheshire was in the, um, in the previous volume of under the letter C, and this was the most important early site for Rickman's antiquarian um, investigation. So we see Chester Cathedral, in the middle, the brick terrace, is uh, at a place called Blackfriars in Chester. It's right near uh, the present race course. That was the site of the Rudy Iron Foundry, and its proprietor, George Harrison, who lived in one of these houses, I haven't worked out which one yet, Harrison was a major influence on Rickman at the very start of his design career. And Rickman, there's a note in the diary saying, oh, Harrison wants me to design a Gothic bit of cast iron work. I, maybe I think I can do it. Uh, and this goes back to you know, 1809, 1810. He's visiting um, the Harrison family, attending mass at Chester. Harrison's brother was a clergyman. So you see how embedded he is in the world of the Anglicans as well as the world of the Friends. And then finally, Wales, of course, and antiquaries dream. So many monuments to explore from the medieval past. This is the Valle Crucis, the, the ruined um, Cistercian. Uh, monastic foundation that Rickman visited. He was frequently in North Wales during his time as resident in Liverpool. Um, early design work, some surprising things are starting to come to light. Of course, Im we immediately look probably at the lower left, the cast iron churches are well known and well published. In Liverpool, uh, Thomas Rickman collaborated with the iron founder John Cragg of Merseyside uh, Mersey Iron Foundry on three separate occasions. It's probably this one, St. George in Everton, which bears the strongest imprint of Rickman himself and his design work, um, but it was very much a collaborative effort. We can't say this is a building entirely by Thomas Rickman. Everything you're looking at, practically, except the stained glass and the wooden pews is cast iron in the inside. Delightful church, um, but Rickman is sometimes cast as a modernist in his use of cast iron, I would say it was much more for him a practical solution to a problem about how to get accurate tracery designs into churches. Uh, Walton Hall, looking terribly sad in the upper left, um, this was the home, the residence of John O'Kill, a Liverpool antiquary and collector, and Rickman was doing work for him on the house and designed the, um, the Doric portico, which is barely visible beyond the kind of muddy field in front and outbuildings for the house in 1814. So this is remarkably early stuff before the publication of the attempt. Combermere Abbey, which some of you might know of in Cheshire, it's on the Cheshire uh, Shropshire border, uh, in the upper right has just been refitted, uh, sort of renovated if you like. It's part stucco. The stucco bit looks a bit like Strawberry Hill, but it's all the um, English Regency period. Rickman, we know, was there designing cast iron railings, uh, gate piers, outbuildings for Combermere. Uh, was he designing some of the actual features on the house? Uh, I suppose watch this space, more investigation to be done. And then furniture. It's clear from Rickman's diaries he designed a great deal of furniture. But I had no idea who might be making this stuff up and what it looked like until another antiquary, Martin Levy of Blairman's, found these stamped gillows, oak Gothic chairs for, for Scarisbrick Hall, which was one of Rickman's very early uh, remodeling jobs. And the diary entries suggest these date to 1816. So again, remarkably early, some of the uh, designs that I'm finding. And then my final uh, slide with pictures in it, Rickman's first major commission, the church now part demolished of St. Mary's Birkenhead, 
this uh, is his first entire work on his own. It, it was a pivotal commission because Bishop Law visited and on the basis in 1819 of what he saw of the church going up and the designs, he was able to go back to the church commissioners who were hemming and hawing and strongly urge that they give Rickman his first two churches on the basis of this commission, which was private and for a North Wales landowner who was going to develop a holiday village on the site. It was a completely open land with a wonderful ruin, which still exists. Uh, it's, it, the Buck Brothers print is in the upper left, and what it actually looks like is a museum, Priory uh, Museum, the Priory Birkenhead on the lower right today. It's a bizarre location because it's, of course, across the Mersey from Liverpool, and part of the actual burial ground of the church was sold to one, I think, Mr. Laird and the Camel Laird Shipyard operates there today. So you have these enormous yellow cranes just visible in the slide swinging around almost over the remains of the Rickman Church and the ruins of the 12th century Benedictine Priory. Uh, courtesy of another um, fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, Max Donnelly, I was able to recently have a look at the, uh, some of the doors which came from the interior, the western end of St. Mary's, and that's the little bit of cast iron you see in the middle uh, left, uh, in Rickman's best decorated uh, Gothic tracery, his best uh, Gothic style. The doors are in uh, quite a sorry state of repair, so I haven't shown you a, a full view. And there are loads of bits of stonework lying around in the churchyard. All, the entire commission, from digging the foundations to putting on the spire, is recorded in the diaries. That's how you can get at this uh, pivotal commission mixed with loads of other stuff. The names of the craftsmen are all recorded, the carpenter, and we learn that he didn't use uh, Crag for the ironwork on this occasion. It's his first use of the Eagle Foundry in Birmingham, uh, which later becomes a major uh, factor in his uh, later cast iron work. So these are just some of the nuggets of gold that are being thrown up by this sort of chipping away at the coal face. Uh, and I would be delighted to hear from fellows uh, about um, any information, any observations, any thoughts you might have um, regarding Thomas Rickman. I now turn over to my very dynamic colleague, uh, Alex Buchanan, who's going to explain how she's, we might say, spread the word of Rickman. <laughs> So I got in touch with Megan um, about three years ago now, I think. Um, I had recognised that we were going to have this bicentenary of the publication of The Attempt to Discriminate, which I felt was, um, as an adopted Liverpudlian, was a really significant event for Liverpool. Um, Thomas Rickman, as we've heard, uh, rolled up in Liverpool in 1807, big year for Liverpool, the um, year in which the slave trade was abolished. Um, but he turned up there under unfortunate circumstances. He was bankrupt. We've already heard that he was exiled from his family. He expected his beloved wife, Lucy, to join him, but a month later, she died. So it was all very tragic. But Rickman, being the sort of man that he was, he, he wasn't going to let himself be got down by this. So he pulled himself up by his bootstraps, went walking, looked at the medieval buildings around him, and started to realise that he could say something new. And there's a lot in the diaries, as, as Megan has already said, of woe is me, woe is me, and then the transformation into recognising that he had something to contribute. So I thought this was a wonderful story for, for Liverpool, this first book and, and the, the transformation of, Liv of Rickman's career from bankrupt to eventually successful architect all happened in Liverpool. So I got in touch with Megan and it's been wonderful collaborating with her. She's an incredibly generous scholar. So um, if you want to know things about Rickman, she really does know everything, though there is even more, as she says, to find out. So we wanted to make this into a bigger, a bigger project and our aims were to stimulate interest in Rickman and his work, both locally and nationally. As I say, I think it's a, a real success story for Liverpool, which need success stories, quite frankly, um, and to recognise that Rickman had got this important national role. 
I first came to Rickman all unknowingly as a teenager um, at school. We had a, an, a history teacher of the very oldest of old style who felt it was very important for his girls to know how to discriminate the styles of Gothic architecture. Um, so, look at it, girls, round arch, Romanesque. So we, we, didn't get, we didn't get Norman, but we got early English decorated and perpendicular. And I had no idea that this was originally Rickman's classification. But the sense of empowerment that I felt from being able to look at a building and to be able to date it was really something that I wanted to be able to share. Um, so raising the awareness of this method, you can really see how the book, why the book was so successful. Before this, Gothic buildings were something quite mysterious. They were somewhere where you could go to meditate on the passing of time, um, on death, on ghosts, all that sort of thing. But with Rickman, it becomes something you can understand. And you only have to look at the building in order to be able to understand it. You don't need to go to the Chronicles, you don't need to read Latin, you don't need to have a lot of knowledge to be able to say something about a building. And that was incredibly empowering to 19th century readers. We wanted to set this work within a wider intellectual, socio-economic and political context. And in order to do this, we needed to build links with other researchers. Rickman himself was a great networker. He had contacts all over the place. He was a lovely man that people seemed instinctively to warm to. And for us, it's been equally uh, instructive how many people have got interests in Rickman and interests that can bear on understanding Rickman and his work. So we wanted to try and build more links um, with other people. So what we've done so far, We've got a couple of websites, um, the Thomas Rickman website and the Architecture and Society website. Um, they are both very much works in progress. This is a midpoint of a project. We're not quite at the beginning, but we're definitely not at the end. So um, we'd be grateful for anybody, as Megan's already said, to get in touch with us if you've got things that you can bring to this project. We held a conference at the University of Liverpool in May, at which a number of our fellows spoke. We aimed there, it was called Thomas Rickman's Liverpool. So this was about setting Rickman within a local context. So we had a day on Liverpool, Liverpool, Liverpool people, the Liverpool context, and a day on architecture. And then a third day of a visit um, to Grich Castle in North Wales, which wonderful place if you've not been there do go along it's a place that's being restored or conserved i think more than restored um, a ruin but a wonderful rickman site that is being preserved by its local community so it's a, a wonderful place we've had an exhibition at liverpool special collections at the university um, this has mainly tried to set the book in context we had a full set of Rickman editions um, held by the university, but also a number of the books where, when Parker got hold of the publication, he started adding more and more illustrations. So we were able to bring together Rickman's sources, other books that Rickman was connected with, so for example, the 1830s edition of Cotman, has um, in information from Rickman in there, but also the other books that Parker culled to bring illustrations um, for the new editions of Rickman. Um, connected with that, we had some Rickman-themed walks, one of which is available on the Thomas Rickman website. So if you come up to the University of Liverpool, you can do a walk of the university's buildings and attempt to discriminate the styles of the University of Liverpool's buildings. So no Gothic, but you can find some brutalist buildings, modernist <laughs> buildings, freestyle buildings. Um, so using Rickman's method to date buildings of a completely different period. Um, the Rickman Project has developed into an AHRC-funded network um, called Architecture and Society in an Age of Reform, 1760 to 1840. You'll see that the dates are pretty much the dates of Rickman's life. And we had our first meeting of that network in September 2017, and we're hoping to have future meetings in Birmingham and Bristol, 
both sites closely associated with, uh, with Rickman. We know, we've already heard that he moved to Birmingham in the 1820s, but he also did a lot of work in the Bristol area. So we've, we've focused on places that have got a strong Rickman connection, but also places that we think can tell us about this wider theme of architecture and reform. And the aim of this network is to bring together both architectural historians and historians in other fields to think about how architecture relates to this age of reform, how society changed and how architecture is integral to the societal changes that happen across the, the long 18th and long 19th centuries. We've already made some new discoveries. Um, Megan has already alluded to some of them. One of them is not so much a discovery as a rediscovery. We already knew that William Huell had heavily annotated a copy of Rickman's text, but I didn't know where it had gone. I tried to find it when I wrote um, the biography of Willis, but was alerted to another of our fellows owning the copy, purchased only about 10 years ago. Um, and she's been very kind to lend it to us for the exhibition at the Special Collections. It's also going on display at Liverpool Record Office at the end of November through to January. And this is full of wonderful notes by William Huell, another very important fellow who wrote on Gothic architecture. He's primarily known as a scientist, indeed the coiner of the word scientist, but he was also a keen architectural historian in his own right. And this is one of his drawings inserted in the book. So hopefully I would like to do an addition of the annotations to the book. We've made a number of new contacts. Um, we've reconnected with John Bailey, whose thesis we've already heard about, a wonderful, wonderful source. Um, I've only this week heard from somebody who's writing the history of the Incorporated Church Building Society. So that's been another contact made through the Rickman website. And we've connected with other projects. Um, there's a project based at the University of York and the University of Glasgow called Institutions of Literature. Um, a meeting was held recently at the Society of Antiquaries about this project. We've got another meeting in York um, at the beginning of December. Um, but as we've already heard, Rickman is an important architect working with institutions. So there have been a lot of interesting contacts made there. Another project, the printed and the built, looking at the connections between printed works and built works. Again, Rickman, very important for this. Um, you can really see how his book and his buildings link, but also how his book and other architects' buildings link. We're also connected with another number of other bicentenaries. The Liverpool Royal Institution, um, one of the institutions of literature in Liverpool, Rickman himself was too poor to belong to this one. He belonged to a lot of other institutions in Liverpool, especially the Lytton Phil, but he didn't belong to the Royal Institution. Um, but its bicentenary is this um, November, so we're having a big celebration of that. And the Incorporated Church Building Society, and as we've heard, next year, the Church Building Commission. My research on Rickman is primarily on the book the text um, and I've been doing some work trying to trace every copy that I've been able to so again please if you have copies of Rickman books that are annotated in any way or whose ownership is known please get in touch with me I'd be delighted to find out about them this one was a particularly interesting find for me so the Getty Institute has a copy that was clearly at Snelston Hall as we um, know from the book plate, and Snelston Hall was being built at the time when the owner of Snelston Hall must have bought this book. Um, and as you can see, it's Gothic, so I think the two must be connected. We have the same thing at Little Crosby Hall, where Rickman's book was presented to the owner, Crosby, um, at the time when he was starting to build buildings in Crosby, many of which are in a Gothic style. So clearly this is a, look mate, if you're getting on with this sort of building, you need to have this book. Doesn't look as though he ever read it though, the pages are remarkably clean. Whereas copies that I've looked at that have come from mechanics institutes 
are filthy. They are very, very well thumbed. So it's very interesting looking at original copies and trying to see how they've been used. So I've got lots more examples of that sort of thing, but I won't talk about them for very long, just to see the wealth of the material that's available. Um, the copy above is um, from the Internet Archive, so anybody can look at that, and it's got a couple of illustrations of different forms of arches. I found quite a few of these, but this is only one of the ones that I've illustrated. Um, the one with the lots of notes, we don't know who it belonged to, unfortunately, but it's in the Birmingham University Library, and you can see how heavily annotated it is. Um, nearly as heavily annotated as William Hewell's copy. So it's very clear that this is a book that people interacted with, and it's these interactions that I'm really interested in. Right. This is another page from the Birmingham University copy, and you can see here that they're contributing to ideas about Gothic in the book, recording um, what Mr Skidmore of Coventry, so I wonder whether there's a, a local connection um, with Birmingham, um, given where it is now, um, that um, maybe Rickman is wrong, but um, he's not the, the author, male or female, of the annotations, isn't sure that Skidmore's right either. So I suspect that in the main, Mr Skidmore's theory is untenable. But it is quite possible that some of the ornaments may have been imitated from metalwork. Right. So, as I said, we're in the middle of the project at the moment. Um, future meetings in Birmingham and Bristol next year. Um, the Birmingham meeting is going to be in June. I'm afraid because I'm having a baby in February, we're not quite sure when the Bristol meeting is going to be. It was going to be in March, but I don't think that will be possible now. So probably sometime in the autumn. Um, we have a conference, however, where the date is known. This is Architecture and Society in an Age of Reform. Um, at Lambeth Palace Library, and we're very grateful to Lambeth Palace Library for partnering with us in putting on this conference. Um, this will be an international conference, supported by the AHRC. We have four international speakers. Um, so a call for papers is imminent, so if anybody would like to give a paper, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, we also have a number of public engagement and education events at Liverpool Record Office and elsewhere. This is in line with my ambition to get Scousers to be able to discriminate the styles of architecture. So I hope that this gives them a similar, our audience, a similar sense of empowerment to the one I felt as a teenager. We have exhibition boards that go with the exhibition that has already been held at um, Special Collections, is moving down to the Record Office. If anybody is connected with a Rickman building, we'd be very happy for you to borrow the boards, time, time frames um, permitting. They'll be at Lambeth next summer. We're already in negotiation with St John's College, Cambridge, um, with a community building in Bristol that um, has a Rickman connection designed by Rickman and various other sites. But if anybody would like to borrow them, as long as we can get them to you or they can, you can collect them from us, they are, they are available. So please get in touch. So if you're connected with a Rickman-related site, please get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to hear from you. We'd be delighted to publicise anything about your building. If you know of any undocumented Rickman-related archive material, again, it's a huge archive. It's very distributed. We'd love to know about, about it. If you've got a copy of one of Rickman's books, even if it's an 1881 edition, I'd be very interested to know if it's got any ownership information, if it's got any annotations, if it's got any signs of use. And if you can give a paper at our summer conference, please submit one, and please submit an abstract. Again, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So as I hope you can see, the Rickman project's got a long way to go yet. But nevertheless, we've found some really exciting things already. It's been a project I'm really delighted to be involved with, and we hope that you'd all like to be involved. Thank you very much.